Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Metrolina Worship at Home. Pastor Dean Burris, great to be back with you all again this week. Uh, thank you for your prayers for me and my wife. Uh, over the course of this past week, we've been working through a, a um, upper respiratory uh, virus and missed last Sunday with you guys, and it's good to be back with you this week. We're still not 100% back, still struggling a little bit. And um, uh, still feeling it in the chest and the throat. So hopefully uh, you can bear with me as we meet together again this week. I was looking forward to this. Uh, couldn't wait to get back with you this morning as we continue our series, Bible Questions and Bible Answers. And we're going to look at our fourth question this week in that series. But hopefully you've had a good week and I hope that you haven't been going through this this uh, crud that my wife and I have, but that you're doing well. And, you know, sometimes it's just a rough week, right? And um, and so I'm going to bring a video in just a moment and a worship, also a worship song that um, gives us a little laughter, a little humor, as well as a great word of encouragement through song. So uh, I'm just glad to be back with you this morning. So I wanted to share with you all a couple of announcements uh, of some events, two events that our church has coming up in the next few weeks. And so in December, our church is going to the Gaither Vocal Band Christmas Tour in Concord, North Carolina. And maybe it's the weekend for you to make a road trip up here to the Charlotte area. I invite you to come and join us. Let me know if you're going to be able to make it, and I'll make sure we save a ticket for you. It's going to be a great evening. That's Sunday, December the 8th at 6 p.m., and we're going to have a good good time. So drive on up and join us. Let me know that you're coming for this a very enjoyable, worshipful fun Christmas weekend. And then also we have, uh, uh, in a few weeks, we have a night of worship at White Hill Senior Adult Apartment Complex. And this is the place where our church does ministry on a weekly basis, Bible studies, and uh, we bring meals and, and groceries to the residents there. And a couple of times a year, we have a an outdoor worship service for the folks at White Hill. So this is the White Hill Night of Worship. Uh, if you're in the area, come out on Friday night, October the 4th. We have a worship band there. Uh, we're going to have prayer together, some, some refreshments and snacks together, and just a great way to reach out to the residents of this community. So uh, join us if you can. Pray for us, of course, and um, and be a part of what God is doing in these in these worship events. So I wanted to share those two things with you. So I came across a, a video that I got a little chuckle out of this week, and um, and I thought it was a good video to share with you all this morning. And if you've had a rough week, this video and this time is for you. Then we're going to follow that up with a song that just leads us right into a time of great worship. So let's laugh. Let's worship. Let's enjoy this together this morning. Yes, that's right. If you've had a rough week, you've come to the right place. Welcome to church. It's so important that we gather, that we come together, that we set aside this day, this time each week 
uh, to refocus, to get re-energized, to find the help that we need, to confess, God, I need you. I can't do it without you. So if you've had a rough week, welcome to the club and welcome to church. This is the place to meet the one who meets all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And I want to share this worship song with you this morning that I think speaks to that and is an answer for those who have had a rough week. Let's worship the Lord through this song together. I confess Bowing here I find my rest And without you I fall apart And you're the one That guides my heart And Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you Where sin runs deep your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness Is Christ in me And where you are Lord, I am free
Yes, yes. The Lord Jesus Christ is the antidote to our rough weeks. I need you, Lord, how I need you. And uh, he is the strength. Um, He is the tower, the strong tower. He is the the place of refuge uh, that I can go to to find uh, the help that I need when I go through difficult times. And and um, if you've had a rough week, and then or the next time you have a rough week, you go to the Lord, cry out to the Lord, and in, and in, and in Christ, um, He is the one who will help you stand. And that's what He's been to me this week. So I want to lead us in a prayer before we jump into our lesson for today. And uh, one of the things that I worked on this week since I um, I didn't leave the house uh, much at all, just trying to rest and recover and and working through this um, this sickness. But um, one of the things that I worked on was um, researching uh, uh, the Psalms and um, wrote uh, some things down. But I wanted to do some morning and evening prayers from the Psalms. And so I'm going to be introducing this over the next few weeks, I wanted to actually pray from this list. So it's just praying back psalms to the Lord, starting every day with with a prayer of psalms to the Lord and ending every day with a prayer of psalms to the Lord. And um, I found it so helpful, so encouraging, just so beautiful to pray back these psalms uh, to the Lord to begin and end each day. So I wanted to lead us in a prayer just from uh, the first few chapters of the Psalms. And I pray that this would, if you've had a rough week, that this would be encouragement to you. And let the beauty of the Psalms speak to your heart as we pray, as we pray together. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. O Lord, hear us as we pray. Pay attention to our groaning. Listen to our cry for help, our King and our God, for we pray to no one but you. Listen to our voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning, we bring our request to you and wait expectantly. Lead us in the right path, O Lord or our enemies will conquer us. Make your way plain for us to follow. O Lord, we give our lives to you. We trust in you, our God. Do not let us be disgraced or let our enemies rejoice in our defeat. Show us the right path, O Lord, Point out the road for us to follow. Lead us by your truth and teach us. For you are the God who saves. All day long, we put our hope in you. Amen and amen. Wow, I just just find that so, so incredibly powerful and beautiful, and enriching to the soul. And I want to be bringing more of this to us and provide this in a format that we'll all be able to use each day to begin our day and to end our day with praying these psalms back to the Lord. May they be a blessing to our hearts, to our lives. Well, we are in the fourth week of our series 
called Bible Questions and Bible Answers. And so uh, you are providing the questions. What does the Bible say about, and you've been filling in the blanks, and I've received a lot of questions. We've been looking at questions about why we should study the Bible, why she would, why we should read the Bible every day, why, how do we study it uh, more effectively? How do we discipline? Um, what does it mean uh, to, to have biblical discipline? What does that mean? And the importance of discipline in our lives. We've been looking at these questions, and this week we're going to take up uh, actually, it's a it's a number of questions about one theme. It's a theme uh, that I received a lot of questions about, and so we're going to take a, a couple of three weeks to go over these questions. And it's the theme about family. The theme about family. So, what does the Bible say about the functions and responsibilities within the family? So, uh, received a number of questions about leadership in the home, about trust, when how do I build trust, how do I rebuild trust when, um, when I've done something wrong. Um, what about kids what is, and adult kids? What is our relationship to, to uh, adult children? Questions about conflict in the marriage, how to overcome family conflict. Uh, what if there have been broken vows in the marriage? So just a, just a lot of questions about the family. And so that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And, and what does the Bible say about family, about uh, uh, relationships, human relationships? What, what does the Bible say about these really hot button uh, topics in our world today. And so we're going to answer that question with the Bible. What does the Bible say about marriage and family and sexuality and human relationships and gender? What does the Bible say about these things? Not, not today's culture. Not what does culture say about these things. And listen, we're going to not, not what Tradition says, yesterday's tradition says about these issues, what does the Bible say? And so that's what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. And so I thought that a good place, a good place for us to start in this discussion is, is you know, we need to lay down a, um, a foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. Need to lay, we need to lay, lay down a, a foundation, and we need to lay down a, a theological foundation on which to, to build. A theological foundation. So the word theology is, is the word about God. So what does God's word say, and what is proper theology, our understanding of, of God, who He is, our understanding of God's nature and God's character, how does that impact the family? And does it impact, impact the family? Well, we're going to see that it does. We're going to see that an accurate theology, what we believe about God, has a direct and an unalterable impact on the design, the definition in the function of family and sexuality and human relationships, we're going to see that theology, what we believe about God, is the foundation of a strong family. Theology is the foundation of a strong family. And so let's, um, let's talk about that for just a second. So the word theology uh, is made up of two words, theos and logos. The word theos means God. The word logos means the word about or the study of. So it's the word about God or the study of God. Theology is the study of God. And there are there are there are two basic or primary truths uh, that we learn from the Bible that have a about God and about uh, Scripture. Uh, two, two primary truths that have a direct impact on the family and on human relationships. And so uh, those two theological truths are 
the let's skip uh, is that, is that God is perfect, the perfection of God, and the immutability of God, and the perfection of God's word and the immutability of God's word. So those are two theological basic truths that have a direct impact on the function of the family. So in order to have a properly functioning family, I have to have a properly functioning belief in theology, what the Bible says about God, his character and his nature. And so we see, first of all, the first uh, theological truth that impacts um, our um, definition and function of the family is the fact that God is perfect. The perfection of God. Over and over again, I have some scriptures listed there for you. It says that God is perfect. Ecclesi- excuse me, Deuteronomy 32, 4 says he is the rock and his word is perfect. Uh, 2 Samuel twenty two thirty one 31 says, as for God, his way is perfect. And Ecclesiastes 3, 14, God's word says that I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. In other words, God is perfect. He is perfect. The second truth is that God, not only is God perfect, but God is immutable or unchangeable. God cannot does not, will not progress. He cannot, will not, does not get better, nor can God improve. He's perfect, and because He's perfect, He is unchangeable. In Psalm 102, it says, In the beginning, you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded, but you remain the same and your years will never end. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. Uh, in Hebrews Uh, In the New Testament, it says Jesus Christ is the same. He's unchanging yesterday, today, and forever. God is unchanging. He does not need to change because He is perfect. Do you see how those two theological truths fit together hand in glove? Everything God has done and said is perfect and without mistake or flaw or in any need whatsoever of progression, change, or improvement. God is perfect. God is unchangeable. And and thirdly, God's Word is perfect and unchanging. Psalm 119.89 says, Your Word, O Lord, is is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And Jesus himself said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. So God is perfect and unchangeable. And what he has said, his word, his written word is also perfect and unchangeable. It's uh, so. How how does this apply, therefore, to the family? How does it apply to the family? Well, because God is perfect and unchangeable, and His Word is perfect and unchangeable. That means that His plan for the family, His order of the family, His design for the family and human sexuality, and human relationships is also perfect and unchangeable. Therefore, what you and I believe about God has a direct impact 
on what we believe and practice about family and human relationships. So we, we cannot say that we know God and we love God while at the same time rejecting His perfect, unchanging plan for the family. Now, we can falsely teach what God says about the family. We can incorrectly interpret what God has said about the family. We can horribly misuse what God says about the family. And that unfortunately has been done and is now being done. But our misuse and misunderstanding and mis incorrect teaching of what God has said does not render what He divinely designed. Um, uh, it doesn't render it bad. It doesn't render it um, worthy of changing or needing to be changed or altered. His design for the family, for sexuality, for human relationships, God's design properly understood, interpreted, and lived out is good for all people of all times in all cultures because it came down from a good and perfect God. And so that's why we laid down this theological foundation because what you and I believe about God what we believe about His Word. That's why we started this series with studying about the Scripture and why we should study Scripture and why we should submit to the authority of God's revelation of, His, of Himself and His plan for our lives through Scripture. We start there. <coughs> and so... What I believe about God has a direct impact on the function of my family. And so in order for my family to function, God has a design for it. And if I will surrender to God's design, if I will build my family on God's design, then I will have the blessing of God on my family. And so that's why we start there. So I want to lay down just some very basic foundational principles, unchanging principles for family and for relationships and sexuality that God lays out in His Word. And so we find an introduction to God's plan and design for the family in Genesis chapter chapters 1 and 2. And we see this uh, there, and we see some foundational principles on which to build our family. I just want to share uh, some of those with you uh, this morning. Um, yeah, let's let, let's go. Yeah, let's go back in Genesis one uh, twenty six through twenty eight. And God said, "Let us make man or human beings in our image." to be like us. And they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created mankind, human beings, in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So here we see God laying out some basic, basic principles, excuse me, um, some basic principles regarding His design for the family. So let's just take a look at, at five, five foundational principles that flow from good theology, God's perfect and His plan is perfect and His unchanging because it's perfect, how this applies to the family. First of all, we see the principle um, that the, regarding the sanctity of human life, the sanctity of human life. We see that established in these verses in Genesis, that God created mankind. He created humanity, human beings in His own image. So this is so important. It's so vital, especially 
and how we relate to others. Because if I get this right, I'm going to treat others the right way. And the, the idea that all human beings, listen careful, we got to get this. This is God's plan. All human beings are created in His image, which speaks to the equal value, it, the equal worth, the, the, the equal sanctity of all human life. All human life is equally valuable and worthy. <clears throat> when we understand that, we treat others the way that God designed us to treat one another. Race, gender, age, ability, responsibility, ethnicity, ethnicity. None of those things make any human being more valuable or less valuable than another. We are all created in the image of God, and we need to respect the sanctity of all human life. The second principle that we see established is the sacredness of gender. It says that male and female, He created them. If you are male, God created you to be male, and it's good. And if you are, if you are female, excuse me, <clears throat> if you are female, then God created you. <clears throat> sorry, so sorry about losing, losing my voice. It's, it's still affecting me. Let me say that again. If you are male, God created you to be male, and it's a good thing. If you're female, God created you to be female, and it's a good thing. God created males to uniquely and specifically relate to females. And it's good. And God created females to uniquely and specifically relate to males. And it's good. This is God's perfect plan, His flawless plan, His unchanging plan for all humanity, for all time. Where we embrace and surrender and submit to God's perfect plan. We see the sanctity of human life, the sacredness of gender, and we see thirdly the gift of the gift of, of sex, sexual relations. It says here God affirms this where he says be fruitful and multiply. And so according to God's perfect plan, sexual relations is his idea and his design and it's good. He designed it to be enjoyed between one man and one woman only and exclusively within a marriage relationship. And that is good. His good, unchanging plan. Fourthly, marriage. Marriage is God's perfect plan. And marriage is sacred. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. For the male human being is the, is the exact word there in the, in the Hebrew. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a companion for him who corresponds to him. And so uh, this, it's God's blessing on marriage. Marriage is God's perfect plan. And it's very sacred, and we should honor it. And then the, lastly, the last principle, foundational principle of marriage and uh, human relationship and sexuality that we find God lay out His perfect plan for human, human beings is that marriage is between one male human being and one female human being for life. This is God's revelation of His design for human relationship. It's His perfect, unchanging plan. And Jesus Himself confirmed this foundational principle in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, where Jesus said, Haven't you read the Scriptures? They record that from the beginning... God made them male and female. And he, and he quotes from Genesis 2.24. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united 
into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And so here in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we see God lay out a beautiful, a perfect, a timeless, and unchanging plan for family, for human relationships and sexuality and marriage. God lays out His perfect plan. But that begs the question, doesn't it? What in the world happened? What happened? Because this is far from most of our reality, that this kind of of happiness and joy and acceptance, uh, enjoying God's perfect plan. What happened to this plan? Why is there so much conflict and disagreement and hurt and pain and abuse and suffering in family and marriage and human relationships today? What happened? Well, sin happened. Sin happened. God's perfect, God's beautiful, God's unchanging plan was corrupted by sin. It was polluted by sin. And sin, at its core, is selfishness. Selfishness. And when we read the next chapter in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 and then into chapter 4, we see the immediate effect of sin on the family on marriage, on human relationships. We see when Adam and Eve sin, when they believe the, the lies of Satan over the truth of God in His Word, and that's what we have to do, right? We have to decide, well, I believe God in His Word about family, about human relationships, about sexuality. Will I believe and surrender to God's Word or will I listen listen to an alternative view? And when they, when they, when they chose to reject God's revelation of His plan for the family, as we just discovered, we see it immediately devastate the family. We see shame. We see brokenness. We see separation. We see selfishness. It was that woman you gave me, God. We see distrust and blame. All of this as a result of rejecting God's plan for the family. And then in the very next chapter, that rejection, that rebellion against God's plan gives birth in Cain and Abel. It gives birth to jealousy, to envy, and finally murder, murder. And we today experience the long-term effect of sin on the family that's exploded into rebellion in greed, in lust, sexual immorality, pornography, adultery, incest, homosexual practice, abortion, abuse, conflict, murder, divorce, hatred of parents, hatred of God, and worship of self. All of these things have exploded from the rejection of God's revelation of Himself, that He's perfect and good and unchanging, and that His plan for humanity is perfect and good and unchanging. Excuse me. (coughs) So God's perfect plan for the family was shattered by our sin And we all are suffering the consequence of it. But you see, the good news, the good news of Jesus is that He came to restore God's perfect plan for us and to set us free from the sinful shackles of broken sexuality and relational conflict animosity and abuse and hurt and sorrow. He came to set us free from that if we will uh, surrender and submit to His authority over our lives. Listen, friends, we are all guilty before God, every one of us. We're all guilty. We all have broken God's plan for us, God's design for us in family, in marriage, 
relationships and sexuality. We've all broken it. We've all been marred by our own sinful choices. And each of us is equally in need, you and me, equally in need of redemption. And the scripture clearly teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory and the revelation of God. But Jesus came and he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead to deliver us from the perverting power of sin in our lives, to rescue our families and our marriages. His call to follow him is a call to completely relinquish our sinful ways and to submit to His perfect good way. Jesus doesn't leave us in our sins, but instead He died and rose to set us free from our sins. Listen, my way is not acceptable to God. Your way is not acceptable to to God regardless of what that way may be. For we are all corrupted by sin. And we all need to understand that each of us, without exception, are sinful and that we need to be changed by the saving, redeeming, restoring, life-changing power of Jesus Christ. You see, we've got to come to grips with that truth first before we can move on to affirming and living out God's plan for the family, God's plan for human sexuality and relationships. I have to confess that my way leads to death. And I have to turn from my way what I think is right and turn to God's way through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, If anyone desires to come after me, to follow me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In other words, I can't keep going my way. I've got to turn away from my way and begin going the Jesus way. I cannot follow Jesus and remain in my same old way of life. You see, His death on the cross does not affirm who we are. It condemns who we are. It tells us that we are not acceptable the way we are that I am not acceptable the way I am, and that Jesus Christ died to set me free from my broken way and lead me to the right way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Come unto me. Whoever comes to the Lord shall not be disappointed. He came to set us free from our sin, to make us new, to put us on the life-saving way of faith in Him. Jesus never told us, follow me and keep your sin. He said, humble yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, turn from your way and follow after me. And so, so in order to understand, in order to to understand God's plan for the family in order to live out the power of God's perfect plan for the family, I must first turn away from any sinful way in my life and surrender to God's way. So what I would, I would encourage you this morning, first of all, to do that, to repent of any sinful way and begin following Jesus in His way. Accept that you cannot Follow Jesus and stay in your sinful way. Jesus himself said, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So to repent means to turn away from the direction that you're going and turn to Jesus. 
Will you do that today? Will you come to Christ today? Repent, turn from your sinful way and turn to Jesus and His way. And then when you do that, you can begin to accept and affirm and live out God's perfect plan for the family. God's perfect plan for the family. God wants to set you free. God wants you to walk the Jesus way in your family. But it has to start here with this foundation. You have to acknowledge that God is good, that God is perfect, that God is unchanging, and God's word and His will and His way and His revelation regarding the family, regarding marriage, regarding human sexuality, regard, regarding human relationships, that what God says about those things. And remember those five foundational principles that we looked at, that what God says about that is true. It's also perfect and unchanging. And I will surrender to what God says and begin living out my family life in God's way. Let's start there. And the next time, we're going to talk about some of those specific things uh, in our life when we're, as we're surrendered to the perfection and immutability of God in His way, in His Word, then we can, be, we've been, we can begin to live out God's plan for the family. So start today. Turn away from your way to His way the Jesus way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to learn, to grow, to understand. I pray, God, that we would consider the way we're living. Are we living according to your way or our own way, which is idolatry? Like Adam and Eve, we have rejected your way, thinking we know better. And so, God, today we repent, we turn away from that. We surrender to you, to your authority, to your will, and to your way. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to die on the cross and rise again from the dead to set us free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin and, the, and someday even the presence of sin, that we can walk in victory that we can live out our lives, that our lives can be changed, our marriages can be changed, our families can be changed. We can experience the power of the divine in our family life. If we'll surrender and submit to your way, reject our own way. Help us to do that today, Lord. Then we can begin to affirm your plan. Then we can begin to live out and understand your plan. So, Lord, help us today to make a choice, to make a decision, to turn to you in your way. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining with me today. I pray that God blesses you. I, I pray that you would think seriously about these things, that you would prepare your heart uh, to live out life God's way. Not what I think is right or what you think is right, but what does the Bible say about family and marriage Human sexuality and human relationship. What does the Bible say about family? And let's live out God's perfect plan. Blessings. See you again next week. Thank you for joining me today.